Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Which leads us to the Vietnam War, what we call the Vietnam War, although it's never actually declared a war. And we have to talk about the overthrow of Diem first. And this is number 11 on your notes. Now, Go Dinh Diem was not popular because of his treatment of Buddhists. He severely restricted their religious freedom, causing some of them to protest through self-immolation. Self-immolation is literally setting yourself on fire. And here is a Buddhist monk, a picture of a Buddhist monk named Ting Kong Duck. Uh, Kong Duck. Uh, he was so angry with the government of Ngo Dinh Diem, so angry with the government of South Vietnam, that in Saigon, on one peaceful morning, he came into the middle of a square, had one of his fellow monks doss him with gasoline, and he lit himself on fire and burned to death in front of everyone um, to show just his displeasure about what was going on in South Vietnam and how the Buddhists were being treated. And this really had an effect because U.S. media got a hold of it and was able to film it. And people in the U.S. started asking, what are we doing in Vietnam? Why are we supporting the Go Dinh Diem if people are so unhappy with him that they're lighting themselves on fire? Communists in the South would organize against Ngo Dinh Diem in 1957, and they form what would be called the VC, the Viet Cong. This would be supported by Ho Chi Minh. They created a network of paths through Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, which would be developed in 1959 to support the, v the VC. And this was called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And you can see how the Ho Chi Minh Trail worked. It came from North Vietnam, went through the jungles of Laos and Cambodia to supply uh, rebels in South Vietnam, the VC, who were trying to overthrow Diem's government. Here's a picture of a young Viet Cong soldier laying a landmine. As his presidency progressed, Diem became more and more corrupt and unpopular due to his failure to address the land needs of the peasants. The U.S. backed a coup, and, and that coup assassinated Diem on November 1st, 1963, a few days before Kennedy was, over, was actually assassinated. And this overthrew Diem's government. After this, the U.S. got more and more involved in Vietnam, gradually escalated from there. President Lyndon Johnson was afraid South Vietnam would fall to communism. He asked Congress for authority to repel attacks on U.S. forces. And Congress granted him this authority with something called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. So that's the first question. What gave President Lyndon Johnson authority in Vietnam? The Tonkin Gulf Resolution. In August of 1964, it gave LBJ broad powers in Vietnam. He could send troops there, send support there, military support, monetary support, whatever he thought was necessary to make sure that Vietnam, South Vietnam stayed afloat and didn't sink. Here's a picture of Lyndon Johnson, again president after Kennedy was assassinated. LBJ sent U.S. troops to fight with the South Vietnamese. So it was U.S. and the South Vietnamese versus the North Vietnamese. Troops would build up under the American commander there in South Vietnam. His name was William Westmoreland. Um, 1965, 180,000 troops were there. By 1967, 500,000 troops were present, U.S. troops were present there. And this was done because William Westmoreland had little trust in his ally, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese Army. Here's a picture of the guy we're talking about, General William Westmoreland. So by 1967, we had half a million troops there, and the U.S. initiated a draft um, to supply these troops. And so kids back home were being drafted to fight in the war. The fighting in Vietnam made the U.S.'s superior technology, manpower, and weapons ineffective because it was mostly guerrilla fighting. Guerrilla fighting means hit-and-run fighting. The Vietnamese would hit us and then run back into the jungle and hide. They knew they couldn't meet us head-on. They used the jungle terrain and guerrilla tactics to wear U.S. soldiers down and frustrate them. Part of guerrilla tactics were, our, were the punji pits. Let's watch this short video about 
punji pits. For centuries, the simple stick was used in a variety of combat environments. Even in an age of modern warfare, this cheap, low-tech weapon has proven valuable. U.S. troops in Vietnam learned this the hard way. Viet Cong guerrillas lacked air power and artillery. Traps were a cost-effective way to significantly reduce the combat effectiveness of American infantry. One individual being injured takes out two other people at one time. But everyone else in that squad is going to have to take their turn of carrying this individual and his equipment. So you've limited their combat effectiveness right off the bat. So if you can get one or two or even three people injured in that squad, then you've either limited or destroyed their combat effectiveness. That unit is no longer viable. In Vietnam, the sticks were made from bamboo and were called punji. There are different varieties or things to be used as punji stick. Probably one of the most effective is a simple piece of bamboo. As you can see, with the bamboo is cut off to a point like this and shaved properly, it's as sharp as a needle. The ability to penetrate um, bodies, clothing, uh, is just phenomenal. It's nearly as good as steel. The effect is absolutely devastating. The simplest trap was the punji pit, a hole bristling with sharpened bamboo stakes. Right here, man, we have our punji man trap. You can see when I lift up, you can see all those punchy stakes down the bottom. This is probably one of the easiest and simplest traps to make up. It's just simply a leg trap utilizing punchy stakes. The top of this trap will be covered with a lattice work, which is just simply fine twigs woven together, placed down over the top of this, and then leaves or whatever normal debris is around the trap so that it looks natural will be placed over the top of it. Stepping into one of these could result in ripped muscles and torn flesh. And that wasn't the worst of it. The North Vietnamese devised many techniques that transformed the simple punji stick into a seriously debilitating and even fatal weapon. In the 1960s, American troops in Vietnam discovered that a very simple weapon could pose a serious threat. The punji pit was a constant danger to U.S. infantry. The Viet Cong used a simple biological agent to make these pits even more treacherous. One of the more effective ways this was used was after this would be shaped, is that it would be filled with human excrement. And that way anyone who fell on this would also have the human excrement imparted into the wound and just starts horrendous infections. Disease carrying punjis and spikes were not always fixed on the ground. Punji traps were sometimes constructed with moving parts. Downward pressure from a soldier's foot would force the punjis or spikes into the most vulnerable parts of his body. Right here, man, we have our ankle trap. The way this trap works is there's a flexible material between the two wings. You place that into a hole so that the entire mechanism is below ground level, so you can't see the spikes. You then place a lattice work over the top of it, as we described before, and an individual comes by on the trail and steps into this. The two wings then fold up, pushing the spikes all the way in. Imagine what it would do to the side of your ankle. And mechanical punji traps weren't limited to attacking a soldier's legs. This is a pivoting leg trap. You've got a stepping plate here. This right here is the pivot. And on this end, the punji stakes. Be covered over with a lattice work and, of course, camouflaged. As you walk by, someone steps into the trap. Their own body weight powers the trap, pushing it up and striking them. Some of the deadliest traps devised have harnessed a powerful and ubiquitous force, gravity. Always available, gravity generates velocity. When a spiked bamboo trap is pulled high in the air, it accelerates towards the ground when released. Velocity plus mass plus sharpened spikes equals death from above. This is called a spiked deadfall. It's manually pulled up into the tree and suspended there 30, maybe even as high as 50 feet up. 
When the trip line is struck, gravity being what it is, it falls very quickly. And anything underneath it will be crushed as well as being stabbed. I'm going to take this t-shirt that we poke just a couple of holes in and place it underneath the spike deadfall and then drop the device on top of it. A really bad day. Okay. So yeah, a really bad day. Uh, punji pits were very effective against U.S. soldiers. And you can see a little graph here of the Viet Cong booby trap. Again, the punji pit. Turning point of the war was in 1968. A lot of things happened in 1968 which made the U.S. decrease involvement. First of all, January 30th, 1968, known as Tet, or also the Vietnamese New Year. Uh, the Viet Cong launched a huge offensive on American and South Vietnamese positions. This was called the Tet Offensive, and it would last about a month before U.S. and South Vietnamese forces could regain full control of their positions. It was a terrible time for U.S. Uh, troops and for South Vietnamese forces. Um, a lot of paranoia running wild in the street. Here we see a North Vietnamese spy being executed by a South Vietnamese officer during the Arvin, the Arvin officer, during the Tet Offensive. And uh, when they caught this spy, they just drug him out into the middle of the street and shot him. This picture became famous. Um, and again, one of the questions, like, what are we doing in this war with, with stuff like this happening over there? People being executed without a trial. It was a surprise to Americans because LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, had been telling them that the U.S. was winning the war and that the Viet Cong was losing. Now, now that seemed like a lie. Like, what are you telling us, LBJ? Um, you said we were winning, but now this Tet Offensive happens and it seems like we're losing. So there was a credibility gap between what LBJ said and what was really happening. Uh, really broke down for LBJ when popular newscaster Walter Cronkite uh, criticized, criticized him on TV. It was the last straw. On March 31st, 1968, Lyndon Johnson, LBJ, decided that he would not run for president again and that the U.S. would negotiate with the enemy to end the fighting in Vietnam and the U.S. would start pulling troops out. There's a picture of Walter Conkright, the newscaster who was able to sway his belief, sway LBJ's beliefs. With LBJ giving up and with the assassination of another popular guy, Robert Kennedy, that was JFK's brother, uh, who was running for president, the presidential, le presidential election was left open for Republicans. Um, <clears throat> so Richard Nixon would actually win the presidential election of 1968. He was a Republican. And um, again, with the death of Robert Kennedy and LBJ not running, left it wide open for him. Here's a picture of Robert Kennedy, JFK's brother, who was assassinated while he was running for president. So Richard Nixon takes over, and what does he do? Well, he had promised a, a pullout and a reduction in forces. Um, he and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, they would plan this pullout of U.S. forces from Vietnam. They would call for a policy of Vietnamization in which South Vietnamese forces would take a more active role in fighting the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese while the U.S. troops would be gradually removed. Here's a picture of the two. Here's Richard Nixon on the left and Henry Kissinger on the right. Nixon removed 25,000 troops in 1969, and by 1972, only 25,000 U.S. troops remained in Vietnam. Remember, we reached a height of 500,000, half a million troops. But Nixon actually didn't stop the fighting. He ordered more bombing raids, not just on North Vietnam, but also on Cambodia and Laos. He wanted to get rid of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the supplies coming south. Nixon wanted peace, but he wanted it with honor. He didn't want it to seem like the U.S. had turned tail and run. He also invaded Cambodia with troops in 1970 to disrupt the North Vietnamese supply lines. Here's Cambodia's flag. Again, here's a map of where we're talking about here. Um, here's Vietnam. Here's Laos. And here's Cambodia. And again, the supply lines from northern Vietnam ran through the jungles of Laos and Cambodia to bring supplies to 
the South Vietnamese. Uh, the, the Viet Cong in South Vietnam, I should say. This eventually forced the U.S. to leave and end the war. The public got mad with Nixon when they found out about his invasion. And they thought, hey, you, you, ran, for a re you ran for election saying that you would pull us out of Vietnam. And you said that we were going to let the Vietnamese take more control over their own fighting. And now you're invading Cambodia. What's going on? It sounds like an escalation of the war. A peace agreement was made in 1973 between the U.S. and the North Vietnamese. Under this agreement, U.S. combat troops would leave Vietnam in March of 1973, and the North Vietnamese forces would remain in South Vietnam. Fighting for U.S. servicemen was over, but the war continued. The North would invade the South in March of 1975. All U.S. involvement with Vietnam would cease when the U.S. Embassy in Saigon was abandoned by officials on April 29, 1975. By that time, President uh, Gerald Ford was in charge, and he was not going to uh, intervene anymore. The capital would fall to the North Vietnamese forces a day later. And this is a famous picture from that fall of Saigon in South Vietnam, the last helicopter leaving the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, South Vietnam. And you can see all the people wanting to get on that helicopter to leave, many of them being, you know, North Vietnamese who had, or South Vietnamese who had helped the U.S. The South Vietnamese had been employed by the U.S. as translators, as negotiators, uh, as, you know, providers of food and things like that. And the South Vietnamese were afraid, rightly so, that when the North Vietnamese came into their country, that they would be treated badly because they had, were sympathizers. They were traitors to the Vietnam and it helped the U.S. occupy their country. And many of those South Vietnamese who did help the U.S. and couldn't escape were put into re-education camps and, and, and try to be purified of their, you know, improper capitalist influence. So Vietnam was over, but the Cold War continued. And to talk about the Cold War, we got to talk about the fall of the Soviet Union. What eventually brought the Cold War to an end? Well, the Cold War continued. But in 1985, things would change when a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev came to power as the General Secretary of the Communist Party in the USSR. Gorbachev would face a number of problems when he took office uh, to control over the USSR, especially economic stagnation and a lack of political freedom. He would initiate reforms to try to fix the system in the Soviet Union, in the, the USSR. His reforms included glasnost, which in allowed for the criticism of the government and some freedom of the press. So glasnost is criticism of the government and freedom of the press in the USSR. He also created something called perestroika, which called for less government control of the economy and more private ownership. Okay? Um, he also reduced troops in Eastern Europe partly to cut back on military costs. The Soviet Union was, was failing at this point in the 1980s. Uh, it, was in, it was losing money. Uh, there was stagnation, again, economic stagnation. People weren't getting enough food. There was just a, a lack of everything that was needed to have a good life. Here's a picture of Gorbachev on the left and former President Ronald Reagan in 1987. Again, they would have numerous meetings during the 1980s about how to reduce U.S. and Soviet conflict, uh, to reduce arms, to reduce uh, the strategic arms limitation treaties were designed to reduce nuclear weapons, uh, and, and the U.S. would destroy some of its what, nuclear weapons, and the Soviet Union would destroy some of its nuclear weapons in order to reduce the the cost to both countries of keeping and maintaining those weapons and also to reduce the danger of an accidental attack. But Gorbachev's reforms would be one of the causes of the USSR, USSR's downfall. These increases in political and economic freedom would encourage communist countries in Eastern Europe like East Germany, Poland, and Czechoslovakia to change their governments and economies. They stopped being communist and they became capitalist and they stopped having dictatorships and became democracies. In 1989, these countries would end their communist systems and become more democratic and capitalist. And here we can see some of the countries we're talking about here that used to be part of the Soviet Union's satellite system. Okay, you remember the satellite countries that surround um, the Soviet Union and provide a buffer between them and the West. Okay, um, 
these countries would cease to be communist, cease to be controlled by the Soviet Union and became capitalist and democratic. East Germany became part of West Germany and they became Germany unified, unified again. Poland became its own country. Czechoslovakia became its own country. Hungary, um, Romania, Bulgaria, later on Yugoslavia, which wasn't necessarily controlled by the Soviet Union, but which was a communist country, would break up as well. All of this meant no good for uh, the Soviet Union. And the USSR itself would fall apart. 14 non-Russian republics would be encouraged by the economic and political reform, and they broke away from the USSR and became their own countries in December 1991. At this point, the Soviet Union was essentially no more, and the Cold War ended. Tension between Russia and the US were eased. And here you can see a map here of uh, the Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union. It's like the the United States, like if all the states of the United States broke off and became their own little countries, that's essentially what happened here. I'm going to show a little video here um, about the fall of the Soviet Union. So let's uh, go out. This is the story of the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, the largest communist land, had 15 republics that were centrally planned. In the Soviet structure, Moscow organized all the big republic of Russia, plus the ones that were small. This communist form of public big industries had central planning providing all the necessities. But up to date little goods come faster if there's computers. They could not stay modern with just big central leaders. And since World War II, East Europe had been divided in ways that were not what each place would have decided. There was not enough freedom, just one old gang in the middle. The war budget too large and people's voices too little. Then 1985 brought a younger guy to the top. And this guy Gorbachev wanted these problems to stop. Gorbachev started Glasnost, more free speech and free news. It was fine for the first time to express many views. Gorbachev's perestroika brought democratizations. For the first time, elections let people steer their own nations. When the Berlin Wall fell, Gorbachev was surprised. But he slowed the arms race and won a Nobel Peace Prize. But then through East Europe, former Soviet states chose to break from the Union and control their own fates. So Gorbachev sighed but chose democracy's course. He said he'd keep things together just with discussions, not force. Old communist leaders feared big changes too fast. The whole strength of the Union might be lost to the past. But new leaders and voters wanted change to come faster. Gorby's middle reform plans now were facing disaster. Yes, Soviet President Gorby wasn't defeated, but each republic's president now has strength just like he did, and Russia's President Yeltsin wanted more strength by far, so they drafted new plans for a looser USSR. But before this new compromise could be implemented, eight conservative communists launched a coup to prevent it. They kept Gorbachev trapped, but people rushed out to help defend the Soviet Congress that they had elected themselves. And Yeltsin joined the people and the coup met defeat. But the old Communist Party now just looked obsolete. So when Gorbachev returned, he was the leader of zero. The union structure was dead, each nation had its own hero. The Soviet Union is now no more, he announced, and Gorbachev sadly left, and Russia's president pounced. Yeltsin said it was time for the big free market test. Public resources should open for anyone to invest. But when the parliament leaders and the public protested, Yeltsin ordered the army to have them killed or arrested. So all profits went private or were bought up offshore. Millions and millions of normal people turned poor And the Soviet Union died before it enjoyed The system Gorbachev wanted fixed instead of destroyed And that's from the History Channel um, Sung, uh, and that's the story of the fall of the Soviet Union, and sung and told by musician and artist Jeffrey Lewis.
And so that ends our show. Um, we'll be continuing our discussion of the Cold War later with another section about the Cold War at home, the Cold War at home in the United States. Well, that concludes our Cold War Abroad notes. That was part three, and it's over. And if you want to get the first two parts, my son Aiden is going to tell you what you need to do. Click the description below and click that like button and subscribe. Yeah, don't forget to subscribe. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Bye. Are you listening?